Hello, and welcome to the Maternal Health Education Project. This is going to be part one of a two-part video series on prenatal care and childbirth, and what to expect during this time period. In the description, we'll have timestamps linking to each question so you can skip ahead as needed. I'm Christy Wilcox. I'm a junior at University of Michigan, and I plan on majoring in gender and health. And my name is Delany Aria. I am currently a freshman at the University of Michigan, and I'm planning on majoring in biopsychology, cognition, and neuroscience. Today, we will be talking to Dr. Bailey, the Director of Midwives at Michigan Medicine. More information about Dr. Bailey can be found in the description box below. And then Dr. Bailey, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Joanne Martina Bailey. Please call me Joanne. Um, I do have a PhD, which is why people refer to me as doctor. But um, I like to, um, in all of my relationships, break down uh, power barrier, you know, power differentials and barriers. So. Feel free to come to the rest of the time. Good. Thank you so much for meeting us today. We will be starting with questions about the first trimester. So first and foremost, just to set the scene, how does someone know they're pregnant? Um, I would say the majority of people um, discover that they're pregnant by um, uh, usually missing a period or having a period come uh, not come when they were expecting, and then doing a home pregnancy test and uh, it's showing the little plus sign. Awesome. And what does prenatal care look like at this point in the pregnancy? So usually in very early pregnancy, there's nothing that, there's no like urgent access needs um, for starting prenatal care. So I would say the majority of people, once they've found out they're pregnant um, and are planning to continue with their pregnancy will, um, uh, a call around or call their regular healthcare provider saying that they're pregnant and asking for about what next steps are. Um, I'd say mostly we encourage people um, if they are able to initiate prenatal care in the first trimester, so in the first um, 12 to 13 weeks of pregnancy, but many people find out they're pregnant, you know, um, very quite early in their pregnancy, so it's not a huge rush to start care right then. Awesome. And we know one of the care models for pregnancy is to an OBGYN. So what does a typical OBGYN visit look like during the first trimester? So what I would actually call this is a typical prenatal care visit, um, since an OBGYN is one particular specialty in that, and there are multiple different types of providers that um, provide prenatal care. Um, so uh, if I guess I'll address what it looks like um, if you see a midwife. Um, and generally, and there's a lot of overlap with if you were seeing an obstetrician gynecologist or a family medicine provider. Um, uh, generally speaking, uh, there is a um, pretty lengthy health history that is collected before the first visit um, of past pregnancies and also past um, health uh, complications and also family history. Um, uh, often, either during that first visit or immediately after, we, there would be um, a recommendation of getting some basic laboratory tests. Um, and then during that first visit, it's usually an introduction to what the care, what expectations, or what the care. Um, it would look like throughout the rest of the pregnancy a review of that, you know, obstetric and medical histories um, and um, uh, answering or addressing any immediate concerns that someone may be having regarding their pregnancy, like if they're having lots of nausea and vomiting, like um, talking through strategies regarding that. And then, um, and then what I would consider the meeting people where they're at, like so thinking about once we know some of their health history, et cetera, say she's a tobacco smoker, would be um, starting to set the stage for, you know, you're smoking a half a pack a day, um, is this what you plan to continue during your pregnancy? And if they're, like most people, already feeling really terrible that they're smoking, um, you know, starting to strategize what would be ways to uh, adapt a more health-promoting behavior. So maybe that's you know, uh, cutting back on smoking or switching to e-cigarettes or some other form of nicotine. So that's one individual. Some people may say, I really want to improve my diet because I don't eat very well. So, um, uh, pick, you know, discussing what can we do to help 
um, support and kind of baby steps that um, uh, addressing that um, health behavior that uh, individuals feel like they're ready to um, or want to try to shift during their pregnancy. That sounds great. Um, going off of that, is there anything special that someone should expect during their first appointment or their first few appointments with their provider? Um, it's pretty common um, now, though, um, not necessarily um, an evidence-based um, practice, but it's pretty common to do an ultrasound um, in that first uh, that first visit to verify that the pregnancy is continuing on, it appears um, normal, and is in uh, what appears to be the correct location inside the uterus. That sounds great. And then in these first few appointments, how would someone be able to advocate for themselves with their providers? So um, I always encourage people to, um, to make a list of questions, right? You know, to come with their questions. There's something about being in a not familiar environment, especially when you're feeling anxious or excited, anxious, nervous, and um, you know, healthcare systems are generally not designed towards making people feel the most comfortable. Like you might not meet your provider until you're already undressed, for example, which I think uh, I personally think is a terrible way to meet someone for the first time. Anyway, all of those things lead to making it hard to remember what's in what's important uh, to you as far as what questions you might have or you want to be sure that you talk about. So. Having written down questions, whether that's in your phone or on a piece of paper, is a really great way to um, uh, uh, start it. Also, having someone with you who you feel like is an advocate for you, so that might be your, um, you know, primary. It might be, you know, so a primary support person, a partner, or a family member, or a close friend who could also ask some questions, especially if you're feeling like it's, you know feeling flustered or uncomfortable in the process. Those are some great strategies. Thank you. And then working off of that, how? what are some major changes that someone should expect their body to go through during the first trimester? So first trimester, a lot of people, you know, pregnancy is not visible, right? Um, if you think about, you know, the uterus is still extremely small, um, but there's a lot of symptoms that some people experience. Um, uh, feeling very, very fatigued. Um, other times, often um, feeling breast tenderness or even feeling like breasts are, are growing in size. That's really common. Um, obviously, you don't uh, have vaginal bleeding. Um, so that's probably the most common change, uh, even though we sort of think about, well, once you're pregnant, you don't, you don't have a period. Um, and then some people uh, will have a lot of food aversions. Um, so nausea and vomiting, and so like vomiting like every day, et cetera, is kind of on the extreme end, but a lot of people will um, be uh, only interested in certain more bland foods um, uh, during that early part of pregnancy. Thank you. And then at this point in the pregnancy, what are some options um, do people have, do, like in terms of terminating or continuing with their pregnancy? Yeah, so, um, uh, during the first trimester, so when we talk about um, in the United States, about half of pregnancies are unplanned, meaning someone didn't get pregnant, say, I really want to be pregnant right now. Um, and if we look at that half of pregnancies that are unplanned, about half of them have half of that half, right? So a quarter of all pregnancies are really undesired and not want, and the person does not want to continue being pregnant. Um, and then the other half, people are like, well, I wasn't planning on it, but, you know, this is, you know, no time like the present. So obviously unplanned doesn't necessarily mean undesired, um, but it is at that initial assessment point, okay, what is, what's the additional information that I want or need in order to make a decision for myself? Um, and here in this country, um, for, uh, unfortunately, abortion services are very separate from the rest of healthcare services that are available. So you can receive counseling on abortion, um, uh, ideally at your regular care provider, but there are a lot of states where that's not required from, if the provider doesn't believe in abortion, then they're not required to tell you a range of options. So always being very cautious of um, who's giving you advice on what, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, so about options, 
um, if you decide or you think that you want an abortion, then going to an abortion care provider, um, Planned Parenthood being the most common location. And they have a whole decision-making process embedded within their visits as well. No one um, comes there assuming that this is what your plan is to have an abortion, but rather, once again, all of the options and the pros and cons of them are laid out. So I'd say that that is actually a great place to get a full comprehensive access to um, to options at that point in pregnancy. And that those options also include adoption, which some people choose to continue the pregnancy, but to plan to um, have the, the child be adopted. Um, and um, so really, it's, uh, do I want to stay pregnant, yes or no? Um, and then am I going to um, plan to parent this child? So those are the questions that need to be asked. Thank you so much. Um, we will also have additional information and links to this in our bio or in our description as well. And then um, moving on to the second trimester, are there any like specific symptoms or changes that someone should expect to see from the first trimester going into the second? Um, so definitely transfer into the second trimester. Um, often women who are um, pregnant people will have felt perhaps very fatigued or that nausea, et cetera, in the first trimester. And then um, second trimester, usually that gets a lot better. So many people will feel more normal. Um, and have their regular, you know, their more typical energy, etc. And it really isn't until um, kind of the middle of that second trimester where it becomes more common to be able to feel, actually feel fetal movement. So that is a very common symptom. And um, some people, especially if it's your second or more pregnancy, will start to look pregnant. Like people will be able to identify it. If you're having your um, first pregnancy. Um, Many people don't heart, really don't look very pregnant until they're almost like 20 weeks or halfway through their pregnancy. That's good to know. And then um, you mentioned fetal movement. Um, what is there anything that people should anticipate that feeling like, or is there anything that they should be aware of? Yeah. So uh, most people in that very very early fetal movement will say that they feel like a strange fluttering or a real subtle sensation and that it can be hard to know is that uh, fetal movement or is that, you know, whatever, gas or, uh, you know, intestinal burbles. Um, and then as the fetus gets bigger, then it becomes more obvious, the movement, and you're feeling like little flicks or like little kicks, um, and that sensation becomes more noticeable. Obviously, there are some people that don't feel uh, fetal movement, and some of this depends on the placenta, which is what nourishes the baby uh, during the entire pregnancy. The location of the placenta inside the uterus, if it is towards the front of a pregnant person's uterus, it acts as a pillow kind of between the fetal movement sensations and you know the, the outer belly. And so you just don't feel as much. So people in that situation may not feel movement until they're um, you know, much later in their second trimester. That is super good to know. Um, in the second trimester, are there yeah. any special appointments during this time with the midwife care model, or are there only routine checkups? So uh, it is generally uh, it's standard of care at this point to have, usually in the middle of pregnancy, like about the 20, 20 week mark, so that's in the second trimester, to have a full field survey uh, ultrasound. So it's an ultrasound that takes about an hour where they look in detail at all parts of the baby's anatomy. Um, and it is a, a ultrasound where, you know, they can tell you it, the, uh, the sex of the baby, um, but it's also a reassurance of this, you know, everything looks normal or we're concerned about X, Y, and Z. And so going on a pathway for further um, uh, information collection or potentially treatment. That's super good to know. And then is there anything special in terms of prenatal care that um, the pregnant person should be doing at this point in time, or is it uh, along the same lines as what we saw in the first trimester? You know, so it's very similar in the sense of, um, you know, people can continue with their um, routines of daily life. Obviously, if there are health-related concerns, so this is once again where we talk about tobacco, smoking, substance use, um, uh, being in unsafe situ uh, unsafe 
living situations, et cetera. So all of that care um, continues through those assessments and that care um, and planning continues through um, throughout the entire pregnancy. But sometimes this is a point where someone is feeling a little bit better. So if they're trying to make a change in their um, health behaviors or their situation, second trimester tends to be a time where it's easier to do those things. That is good to know. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to move on to the third trimester. Between the third and second trimester, are there any major differences um, prenatal visit-wise, the duration, um, time in between, or just the care that they're going to be receiving between the first and third trimester? Yeah, so during the third trimester, so first of all, a woman looks uh, very pregnant at this point, right? And she um, will feel fetal movements regularly for the most part. It, um, uh, and uh, look at complications associated with pregnancy, they tend to evolve in the last trimester. So we do more monitoring during the last trimester, having visits um, a bit more frequently. Um, it's also to really uh, plan for the birth experience and plan for after the birth experience. So there's a lot more educational things to do as well. Um, and so I would say, in the third trimester, you're, um, you're having more encounters and uh, we continue to be very vigilant for potential complications that they're coming uh, that are coming up. And all of a sudden it feels more real that you're preparing to actually give birth to this uh, child and kind of step into parenting and what are all the things they have to do to get that set up before, before the baby is born. That is a perfect transition into our next question, talking about what should we prepare for? <laughs> um, there are so many things. Well, so first of all, if you don't do any preparation at all and you just show up at the hospital and say, I'm here to have a baby, we will take care of you. The hospital will take care of you. They're prepared for people who, who um, whatever their life circumstances are that lead to that type of situation. So nothing is one option. Um, but in general, it's helpful. Um, when you're thinking about uh, preparing is like having a hospital bag Mo or you know what do you what do you need to take with you to the hospital um, most uh, health systems have like a list usually that they recommend but you know all of the basics to ca care for you and your baby while you're at the hospital um, in this country are provided for you obviously in other countries that is not true that is not necessarily true um, it is also um, optimally having insurance in order and how the hospital experience is going to be paid for is also very helpful to have done in advance. The uh, majority of people with health insurance will have the pregnancy and birth covered as part of that, so it's just um, continuing on with their care. Um, uh, most insurance policies have uh, a specific like maternity care package that involves prenatal care and labor birth and a postpartum of it. So you just, that should be um, all, all part of it. So something that we did not have prepared but um, was brought up through planning is um, a birth plan. Should women create a birth plan? What should be put on it? Um, you know, when I think about my institution here, and, and I would hope that I speak for every single healthcare provider in this country, is that we really want people who come and receive care for us at the hospital to feel well cared for. We want to um, meet and exceed what their wishes and desires are. And so when you think about like the healthy mom, healthy baby, like that is absolutely the floor of, the, you know, the, the foundation and floor of care that we want to provide. But then really having a birth be a positive experience and a launch into parenthood is also something we really want to offer, you know, to be part of for every family. And so I would say when we talk about birth plans, and um, this goes back to like the very first visit, right, of writing down what your questions are or what's important to you, that um, uh, my general experience is every single person who works with you is going to want to give you the things that, that you're asking or 
And so if you can write them down, this is important to me, this is important to me, then it makes it much clearer for people to follow through on that. Um, I would like to say that 99% of what people put on their birth plans are things that in this country we do for everyone, but unfortunately we're not there yet. And if you, but if you write them down, this is important to me, I want to be skin to skin with my baby for the first hour after birth before any other interventions for the baby. If you write that down, it makes it that much easier for all the staff to support that. Perfect. And then um, once we have thought about preparing, what are some early steps of labor? <laughs> um, so uh, it depends like how early, but sort of classic early signs of labor are starting to have some regular mild contractions. Um, that is how most people uh, notice that they're in labor. And it's really common to have irregular contractions all throughout the third trimester, but that as we're approaching labor, they start to feel more regular, even if they're once every 20, 15 or 20 minutes, they're more regular and then they tend to get closer together and building in intensity over time. Um, it can also, um, in the early part of labor, though it is more rare that someone's water might break, um, and uh, so that's a signal. And early cervical dilation, so if we think about what needs to happen in that early part of labor as the cervix is readying and starting to soften and open a little bit, it is also pretty common to have what is called bloody show, which is a little bit of mucus um, mixed with uh, a teeny bit of blood, so it's not like bleeding like a period, but a little bit of blood with the bloody mucus is considered normal as well. And um, what we should be expecting sign? So generally, um, uh, when we talk about full term, which is when most people have their babies, is between 37 and 40. So 40 weeks is like your due date um, based on your last menstrual period or based on um, an ultrasound. And so three weeks before to a week after are all considered a um, totally normal range for when this would start. Uh, some people have preterm labor, pre labor, which is before 37 weeks, and some folks don't go into labor till they're well uh, after a week past their due date. Perfect. Continuing on to the big event giving birth, what options are available? What kind of variations do we see when um, women give birth? Uh, yeah, so if uh, in the United States, most people give birth in a hospital setting, so that's like 99% of births occur in the hospital. Um, but the other 1% is a combination of home birth, people um, actively uh, planning and choosing to have a home birth or giving birth in a freestanding birth center, which is a center that is not immediately connected or inside of a hospital and does not have all of the technology um, that is associated with hospital births. So those um, home birth and freestanding birth center births are, um, are your committing to um, having a very low intervention, very physiologic oriented birth. You, know, you can't do interventions to um, speed labor up or to manage um, pain uh, with medications. Um, when we think about giving birth in hospitals, um, uh, where once again, a majority of people are giving birth, you kind of have this whole range of options from a very home-like environment in the sense of, or a very um, physiologic or non-interventive environment where just, um, uh, you know, you're in a hospital room and doing some monitoring of the baby, but otherwise not intervening in the birth process at all, all the way to a very interventive birth um, where being induced or being given medications to stimulate or to start labor or even have a cesarean birth. So hospitals really can meet that entire range. So one of the challenges for hospitals is kind of staying hands off when things really are um, low risk and progressing normally. Um, it's uh, something that we in hospital settings are really trying to, um, or well, I guess what I would say is my personal vision is, um, I feel like one of my primary mandates in my job is how to hold space in the hospital for normal birth. And not 
And um, for women going to a birthing center or a hospital or even home births, when should they either go to their place to get their birth or call their own? Well, first of all, and once again, you're having some bleeding over into my recommendations I give to all of the people that I provide care for. But um, you should, anytime you're concerned and don't have the answers that you feel like you need and if you're to take the best care of yourself at home, you should be calling and reaching out to your healthcare provider. But I would say definitely if you're planning to give birth somewhere other than home, um, you should consider going to the hospital if you're having your first baby. Um, going to the, uh, at least reaching out or calling when you're having strong contractions that last for at least a minute that's recurring every three to five minutes and they've been going on already for like one to two hours. So uh, it's hard for people to stay home that long actually because that's a lot of work um, to be experiencing those contractions and especially if you've never gone through it before, um, it's anxiety provoking of like, oh, I don't want this baby to be born at home or in the car, even though remembering that babies are born at home or in the car unexpectedly, extremely rarely, it just does not happen very often. Um, if you're having, if you've already given birth vaginally before, second and more labors tend to go faster. So then we think about, you know, having strong contractions every five to seven minutes or closer together, um, lasting for an over an hour. That is the time to go to the hospital. Um, most um, healthcare systems would want, if you think that you want broken, to go to the hospital. And then, of course, if you have something that you're worried about. So, the primary things that we would be really concerned about if you're not feeling your baby move as much, if you're bleeding like a period, or you're having any other kind of sharp, kind of um, unrelenting or, or um, continuous pain that is not just like kind of that cramp, contraction, cramping pain. And if you feel like your baby's coming out right then, that's another good time to head to the hospital. Definitely. Um, what are some different stages of labor? Um, so, uh, classically, we've referred to three stages of labor. I would argue that there are four, which we're more embracing these days. So, first stage of labor is if you're thinking about the cervix, which was long, thick and close, so it's like this long. And then um, during uh, labor, it thins out till it's like paper thin. Um, if it's, the cervix is closed, you know, thinking about the cervix, you know, that's, I guess that's closed. Um, oh yeah, can't turn it around. So closed and then dilating until it's about 10 centimeters dilated. So the first stage of labor is the, the thinning out of the cervix and dilation. Second stage of labor is once the cervix is fully dilated and the head descends into the pelvis, um, that is the pushing phase of labor. So um, people without any medication will have a spontaneous urge to push, um, which I would describe, and this is my own personal experience, with every fiber of your body says push right now. So it's um, hard to resist that sensation, but if you have medications that have dulled or numbed to those sensations, you might not have that urge to push. Um, so second stage. Um, second stage of birth is all the way through when the um, baby is born, the baby is fully born. And then third stage of labor is after the baby is born, ideally skin to skin with mom, is the delivery of the birth of the placenta. Um, the placenta comes out and then the fourth stage of labor is that um, uh, bonding and recovery. So this is where there are many things that are shifting in the mother's and the baby's body um, during that bonding and recovery phase. That's when breastfeeding is initiated. The uterus contracts down so that the uh, mother is not bleeding. Um, her uh, metabolic system is shifting very quickly, and the, the baby's um, system is shifting extremely quickly as well as the baby prepares to start breastfeeding and continues to, you know, breathe effectively and, you know, do all of those uh, uh, tasks that the baby um, has to do on their own um, now that they're not receiving all that oxygen and nutrients from the mother. And what are some different management options? Um, so, unfortunately, we do not have a lot of pain management options, so to speak. So, I would first categorize them between pharmacologic, so medication-oriented pain management, 
and non-pharmacologic. So first let's talk about non-pain medication oriented strategies. So things that we know um, that help reduce the sensation. Of pain. So there's pain, if you describe it, is the actual physical sensation of something not feeling good, right? So that's pain. And then pain though, in our impression, our interpretation of pain, is absolutely connected to our emotions as well. So if we're feeling anxious, if we're feeling frightened, um, the set, if we're feeling exhausted, the sensation of pain and our response, our ability to cope with it is um, drastically different. So when we're talking about non-medication uh, oriented options for managing pain, they are things that help um, reduce the sensations of anxiety and fear. So that's having support people, continuous support people, like having a doula with you, um, uh, having a family member or um, your partner um, having some skills, having learned some skills to support you during during that process. Um, if uh, we talk about relaxation strategies, learning how to relax the body even while you're you're feeling the exact, it decreases the sensations or the the um, the suffering associated with pain. Um, and then we know that uh, multiple position being in different positions, moving around is helpful. Being immersed in warm water is also very helpful. So that's either in a tub, like being immersed, which helps with muscle relaxation, um, or even being in a shower as well. So water is a great way to help support um, uh, just coping with those sensations of labor. Um, when we talk about um, medication-oriented pain med uh, management, um, sort of the hallmarks that we use are um, opioids or like uh, products like morphine, um, which take the edge off of the sensations of labor, but they don't get rid of it. Um, and uh, so morphine is an option. Um, many institutions now have nitrous oxide, which is inhaled, inhaled gas, like laughing gas, that once again um, takes the edge off of the sensation. One of the thoughts is the primary way that that nitrous works is it actually decreases your anxiety. So it probably doesn't do so much for the actual feelings of pain, but decreases the anxiety around the sensation so that you're better able to cope. Um, and then when we're just talking about what makes the pain less, the most effective form of decreasing the pain is neuraxial analgesia, or often referred to as an epidural. So that's um, providing, a, a, and that's done by an anesthesiologist or a CRNA, which is a nurse anesthetist. It's a procedure that is done that takes away about 80% of the sensation kind of from the top of the rib cage down. And um, once you have that, it really does decrease the sensations of pain but you also tend to have less mobility. You are in bed, um, though you can be in different positions in bed, but you are in bed until the baby is born. And a lot of people have uh, more difficulty having the sensation of needing to pee, so they need to have a bladder catheter as well. And in the time of COVID-19, are there any other um, adjustments that a mother should expect? Yeah, so um, a couple of things, and obviously every institution is doing this differently, um, but uh, is very standard at this point that everyone is recommended or uh, strongly encouraged to have a COVID-19 uh, um, test upon admission so that um, everybody who's providing care for them can be appropriately attired with um, personal protective equipment if they test positive for COVID. Um, there are a reduced number of visitors allowed in pretty much every single hospital. So where we at my institution um, used to have, you know, really an unlimited number of people that could come in, um, now it's down to one or two visitors during for the entire duration of their admission. So those, those are the primary ones. There are some other individual restrictions that different institutions have imposed trying to decrease the um, uh, decrease the concerns. So for example, like here at our institution, we, um, someone who's COVID positive, they can't use inhaled nitric, nitrous oxide because 
they're exhaling forcefully and there's just concern of that um, uh, the virus aerosolizing in the area in the area um, I guess the one other thing is that generally speaking it's recommended that um, the pregnant person wear a face mask whenever she's able when there are um, uh, health care providers present and then her support people to always be wearing a face mask as well so we understand like someone laboring huffing and puffing and laboring we don't expect them to wear a mask the whole time but we do expect their support too. continuing on um in the birthing event what if mom is uncomfortable with medical staff yes well i think this is once again where it's really important to break out what's important what's um uh what's important to you so kind of this birth plan or you know creating this uh uh, uh, uh an additional way of communicating i think this is also speaks to having a support person because it can be really hard to speak up or to um, say something once you're in the medical environment where unfortunately so many of the ways in which we feel in control of our bodies and in our, ourselves is um, either tacitly or um, explicitly taken away from you when you come to a hospital setting. So I think this is where it's really important to have from the get-go that clear sense of trust with the um, health care providers that you've partnered with for your pregnancy care but then also feeling um, completely empowered to be able to speak up or to, to have a signal with your support person so that they can speak up for you if something is going on. And I would say that, um, you know, for those that work in around birth, we, and I guess I'd say I hope that this is not ever how I provide care, but I understand how it happens, that if you're at many births every day, um, and um, caring for women during these intense moments, sometimes that the uh, intimacy of the experience and the vulnerability of it somehow um, becomes less obvious as you experience, you know, as you're um, uh, in this environment. So the people that work in that environment all the time become less sensitive to how vulnerable the experience is. So that is why, and I hope that every institution and every healthcare provider that you work with will be aware of this and actively working against that. But if not, it's so important to have an advocate um, who you can turn to um, if you're feeling like it's hard for you to share those words. Thank you. Continuing on to postpartum care, what are some changes to your body after baby? Uh, not so many changes. Well, um, first of all, most people um, after they've given birth, it's not like the uterus and everything all goes back to the, the same as it was before they were pregnant and they, they can like walk out in their skinny jeans. Um, but uh, so the uterus, the first few days at least the uterus and so the, the belly in general looks more like seven months pregnant, you know, so you look less pregnant but not un not normal so it takes a while sometimes um, six to eight weeks for the uterus to fully return to its non-pregnant size and then it's very common to have um, some additional fat stores during pregnancy and so returning to a pre-pregnancy weight takes uh, longer as well uh, it's common to bleed um, to have what we call lochia l-o-c-i-a or you know this um, bleeding after the baby is born, even up through the first um, six weeks after the baby's born. Um, it tends to taper off so it's more bright red, more period-like immediately after, and then it is off kind of dark brownish, like end of period stuff towards the end of the six weeks. It is, um, and then if you're breastfeeding or chest feeding, then there's a whole bunch of changes that happen around um, breast milk production. Uh, including uh, getting uh, potentially for nipples as, as far as getting used to, to breastfeeding and then establishing a milk supply where um, three to four days after the baby's born is when uh, a person's milk supply really starts to come in and um, it's very common to be engorged or feel over full and uncomfortable with milk for a few days until the breasts start to regulate um, and sort of um, uh, start to regulate in a way that they're meeting where the baby's um, demand is on a day-by-day -day basis. 
and more importantly, how do you care for yourself mentally, emotionally, physically? <laughs> well, I would say having a plan is always helpful. Um, you know, because we're in a world where um, uh, where many people don't have a lot of extended family or support people around them. Um, you might just have a partner or you might feel like you're on your own with just a couple of friends who are stopping in to help. And so the more you can have prepared in advance, the better. Um, and uh, things that you uh, are sure that you want to have are um, good supports for successful breastfeeding. Um, other people to help hold the baby um, when the baby needs comforting so that you can get enough sleep. And when we talk about ways to avoid, um, you know, increased risk for postpartum depression, um, finding ways to get five hours of continuous sleep um, during each 24-hour period is a great way to decrease risk of postpartum depression. And that is very hard because the breastfeeding people will tell you you're supposed to be breastfeeding every three hours. So um, anyway, it's hard. That's very difficult. Um, but you will figure out how to do it. Um, and sometimes that's having another person take one of the feeds so that you can get some sleep, for example. Um, definitely the first two weeks, even after a totally, totally uncomplicated normal birth, you just, your job is to lay on the couch, nurse your baby, and um, have other people cook and clean and bring you food, right? And so, um, setting it up so you're not overextending yourself from the beginning. Um, and if you have a complicated birth or have a cesarean, it you need more support for a longer period of time. Perfect. And um, is there anything a new mother needs to look out for? Uh, well, when we talk about this, there's a lot of different things here. But if we're talking about from like a medical standpoint, the things we are most concerned about are signs of infection. So that's feeling like you've got the flu, having a fever, um, you know, achy. Um, most common sorts of sites of infection are in the breast or in the uterus. So it would be breast pain or perhaps lower abdominal pain. So signs of infection. Um, we always are, um, we know that postpartum depression is very common, you know, one in eight um, uh, people postpartum will suffer from postpartum depression. So um, crying all day, not needing to do it, what, not being able to do what you need to do to take care of yourself, take care of your baby, or um, having thoughts of wanting to hurt yourself or anyone else can be signs of postpartum depression. So reaching out and getting the support you need both from a healthcare perspective but then also supportive environment at home to um, help with your well-being around that those are the primary things okay. that concludes our conversation with japan thank you so much for joining us today we hope this information has been useful to everyone viewing and additional information and time to stay on can be found in the description for more information about maternal health can be found through our channel Thank you so much for watching and we hope to see you in our future.